Throughout the ages, there have been great empires and civilizations that have risen up, their creators ruling nations, regions, and continents for hundreds, even thousands of years. Some of the great legacies and accomplishments of these empires may be lost in the mists of time, but from what they have left behind in rock and ruin, we can trace remarkable stories. China is one of the world's most ancient civilizations, along with the Babylonians, Mayans and Egyptians. There's been official documentation of Chinese history for more than 3,000 years. It is a success story of population movement, economic expansion, technological advancement, all in one. They typically view other people being less civilized to show how civilized they are. So they use outsiders as, as a reference system to actually praise themselves. You know, we're different. We're the people leading civilization. After an imperial history that lasted more than 3,000 years, China in the 19th century descended into what would become known as the Century of Humiliation. The Qing Dynasty was already dramatically weakened after foreign occupation following the Opium Wars. Then, the biggest civil war in history, the Taiping Rebellion, cost the lives of 30 million in just 10 short years. Many Chinese, previously banned from even leaving the country, went overseas, becoming a source of cheap labor in the British Empire, America, and beyond. In 1911, the 400-year-old Qing dynasty collapsed and China faced an unknown future. In the next 100 years, the country would be plunged into war with Japan, a civil war, a communist revolution, and now, strident efforts to become a world superpower once again. With a population of 25 million, Shanghai is the most populous urban area in China and the third most populous city in the world. It's a global center for finance, research, technology, manufacturing and transportation. And the port of Shanghai is the world's busiest container port. In the 1920s, Shanghai was known as the Paris of the East. A crossroads of the world, it attracted white Russians fleeing the Soviet Union, Jews fleeing Europe, and businessmen from everywhere looking for opportunities. 1920s Shanghai was exciting. It was glamorous. It was sexy. It was probably the most fantastic, lively cities in East Asia. Shanghai was free, where everybody could be there doing anything they wanted. Magnificent commercial buildings in the Beaux-Arts style sprang up in the years around the turn of the 20th century, as what was called the Bund developed into a major financial center of East Asia. The Bund historically is an embankment. It was also uh, a place for foreign companies to have their buildings, to have their offices. It's an amalgamation of different architectural style. You can't really pin it down, although it was built between 1910 to 1930s. You do see a variation of different architectural style. Uh, as an area, it's extremely vibrant, extremely energized, partly because of the Huangpu River, the river that brings life to the city. The Shanghai Bund still retains dozens of historical buildings from the period lining the Hangpu River that house numerous banks, trading houses and consulates from all over Europe and Japan. Shanghai is also home to one of the richest collections of art deco architecture in the world. A mix of Western influences and Chinese deco, the city's signature style saw its heyday in the 1930s. Shanghai embraced the mix of East and West in every aspect, from fashion to architecture. In the 1920s, Shanghai was also a hotbed of political and espionage activities, as rival capitalist and communist powers competed for influence, 
following the collapse of the Qing dynasty. In the Western imagination, it's often viewed that China is a very closed and insular place that's disconnected from the rest of the world. But, you know, when we look at places like Shanghai in the 1920s, following the 1919 May 4th movement, this really kicks off a new globalized era for China to reject traditional Confucianism and develop China as a modern nation. The philosopher, politician and physician Sun Yat-sen, who had spent 16 years in exile during the dying days of the dynasty, became known as the father of the nation. His Republican Nationalist Party became a major power after the collapse of the Qing. Sun's philosophy had three principles, democracy, nationalism and people's rights. He's the man who created a new ideology for China an ideology in quotation marks, because it was not a proper ideology by the academic definition we would use. And that kind of gave the young republic, when it was founded in 1912, some kind of idea of what it should be like. He managed to bridge a lot of gaps in Chinese society. He was very idealistic. He was westernized. Remember, he actually got his education in Hawaii and also in Hong Kong. So he actually transcended a lot of you know, internal differences in society. And also, uh, he was not really part of a dirty you know, infighting inside China. Rather, he had this quite pure image of being spiritual leader of the new China Let's do a new republic modeled after either the United States or, or France. You know, that kind of purity really gave him this, you know, you know, bigger than life image. Also, he died in 1925 before he became corrupt. Yeah, before the, the, the power really corrupted him. So he remained very, very clear cut an image. So good for him. When Sun Yat-sen died in 1925, two other figures emerged who were to play a major part in China's story over the next quarter century. The first was Chiang Kai-shek, who from 1926 to 1928 defeated a coalition of warlords in northern China, nominally reunifying China under a new nationalist government. He did so in coalition with the emerging Communist Party. Chiang Kai-shek is very underrated in history. He wasn't a nice man, but he was in many ways quite effective as a leader of China. He was the man who really, if you like, restored China to its rightful place in the world. He's the man who ended the so-called century of humiliation took China into the United Nations as a founding member with a seat at the Security Council holding a veto. The Russians, after their heady victory in the October Revolution of 1917, were increasingly active and under Stalin aggressively promoted and supported the growing communist movement in China. Stalin's agents on the ground identified the man who could lead it. His name was Mao Zedong. He was a good student of Stalin, and he certainly believed in what Stalin did. And he said to Stalin, I, I promise I will make China another Soviet Union, and he did. He, he, he actually kept his promise. Mao was born the son of a prosperous peasant in Shaoshan village in Hunan province. He had a Chinese nationalist and anti-imperialist outlook early in his life. He later adopted Marxism-Leninism and became a founding member of the Chinese Communist Party and helped found the Red Army. I guess the testimony of those who knew him was of someone who was very earthy, like a peasant emperor, someone who was steeped in classical Chinese literature too, 
which is strange because he hadn't read a massive amount of Marxist texts. And someone who was extremely Chinese. I mean, he was from a relatively rural area, Shaoshan in, in uh, Hunan province. He didn't ever go abroad much, I think twice in his whole life to Moscow. Didn't speak a word of foreign languages. I mean, not really that exposed to the outside world. You know, you kind of look at this figure and wonder why they were in charge of this enormous communist insurgency that then succeeded. What people who met him testified to is his enormous sense of energy, almost overwhelming. I think when Nixon met him in 1972, he was overwhelmed by this raw energy. Um, and that was when Mao was an old man. So you can imagine what he was like when he was young, very charismatic, uh, overpowering, um, but also pretty deadly. I mean, anyone who crossed his path, he was an extraordinarily tactical thinker who would work out basically how to bring people down. And so all of those that were named as his potential successors in his life ended up having nasty fates because he became paranoid. So I think what we would call today a person with a complex personality. Mao advocated class struggle, radical land redistribution, and the forcible seizing of land from landlords. Mao was an extraordinary man. I'm not using it as a statement of whether he was a good man or a bad man. I don't think Mao gave a monkey about being good or about being bad. Mao was interested in being successful and by success, by his own admission, he would com like to compare himself all the way back in history to the first emperor of China. And he would see the first emperor as somebody worthy of being compared to him, but not quite. Now, this is the kind of ambition the man had. He was not emotional about uh, his comrades or uh, others, he would do whatever necessary for the cause he believed in. And for somebody who would compare himself to the first emperor of China, he effectively saw himself as China. And whatever he did would by, by definition be good for China. When Chiang Kai-shek purged the communists inside his Nationalist Party, it triggered a civil war with the Chinese Communist Party, which would ultimately have disastrous consequences for Chiang. Against this already fractured backdrop, relations with Japan were fracturing too, culminating in Japan's invasion of Manchuria in 1931. This invasion would eventually set off the decade-long Japanese occupation of China during World War II. Throughout the early 20th century, the Japanese had maintained special rights in Manchuria. They were alarmed when this was threatened by the increasingly successful unification of China in the late 1920s by Chiang Kai-shek. Responding to this pressure, the Japanese army, which was stationed in Manchuria, initiated an incident. Japanese reinforcements arrived from Korea, and the army began to expand throughout northern Manchuria. The Chinese were defeated, and Japan installed China's last emperor, the so-called child emperor Puyi, as puppet head of state. He had been emperor aged two, but he was deposed at six years old, 20 years earlier, when the Qing dynasty was overthrown by the new Chinese Republic. Few countries recognized the new puppet state of Manchukuo. Meanwhile, nationalist and communist armies continued to battle each other. For the communists, this led to the Long March, a military retreat undertaken by the Red Army to evade the pursuit of the Guomindang, the Chinese Nationalist Party Army. The Long March was in fact a series of marches as various communist armies in the south escaped to the north and west. The communists, under the eventual command of Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai, escaped in a circling retreat to the west and north, which reportedly traversed over 9,000 kilometers over 370 days. The route passed through some of the most difficult terrain of western China by traveling west, then north to Shanxi. Only 
about 10,000 of the 100,000 cadres that started the Long March survived. But the Long March began the ascent to power of Mao, whose leadership during the retreat gained him the support of the members of the party. It would come to represent a significant episode in the history of the Communist Party of China. Mao Zedong was a successful leader for two reasons. One is he accepted the political uses of violence. So he embraced uh, you know, this idea that it was no good just trying to promote your political ends if you weren't willing to, in the real world, do some pretty dramatic and drastic and sometimes morally pretty repugnant things to achieve those. He famously said a revolution isn't a dinner party and I think that is proved in his career. At the same time, from 1931 to 1937, China and Japan continued to skirmish in small, localized engagements, so-called incidents. China was dragged into World War II. The Japanese scored major victories, capturing Beijing, Shanghai, and the Chinese capital of Nanjing in 1937, which resulted in what became known as the Rape of Nanjing. This was an episode of mass murder and mass rape committed by Imperial Japanese troops against the residents of the city. An estimated 200,000 combatants and civilians were murdered, and there was widespread rape and looting. Japanese attacks on China were basically pitting a modernized nation with a modernized military against what was in effect an agricultural country with no real effective navy or military at all, not even an air force, which is what China was at that time. Japan had been modernizing for over 40 years since the Meiji Restoration in the 1860s. So the Nanjing Massacre was a brutal a reminder, I suppose, of the fact that Japan really considered China in 1937 when this happened, almost like a kind of place where they could do what they pleased, and they did do what they pleased. The tactic was copied from the Mongols. The Japanese studied the Mongol invasion, the conquest of China very, very closely. They believe the, against all the odds, uh, like the Mongols, they were outnumbered by Chinese. But how can you actually uh, conquer a place uh, so uh, wealthy and so well organized? And the tactics just kill them. Nanjing is remembered not only for the number of people slaughtered, but for the cruel manner in which many met their deaths. Chinese men were used for bayonet practice and in decapitation contests. An estimated 20,000 to 80,000 Chinese women were raped. Many soldiers went beyond rape to disembowel women, slice off their breasts and nail them alive to walls. Not only did live burials, castration, the carving of organs and the roasting of people became routine, but more diabolical tortures were practiced, such as hanging people by their tongues on iron hooks, or burying people to their waists and watching them get torn apart by German shepherd dogs. The massacre has scarred Japanese-Chinese relations even to this day. People dispute the figures, 300,000, 200,000 were butchered over that time. But, I mean, no one disputes that it was one of the great crimes against humanity of the 20th century. 100 million civilians become refugees in their own country, and 9 million died. If you count in all the casualty rates, uh, China lost about 20 to 30 million lives for the fight. During the occupation, the Chinese central government relocated to Chongqing in the Chinese interior. The Nationalist Army and Air Force were able to continue putting up strong resistance against the Japanese offensive. With Japan's lines of communications stretched deep into the Chinese interior, the war reached a stalemate. 
While Japan ruled the large cities, they lacked sufficient manpower to control China's vast countryside. China would end up fighting Japan with the aid of the Soviet Union and the United States. This would become the largest Asian war in the 20th century. It accounted for the majority of civilian and military casualties in the Pacific War. The war has been called the Asian Holocaust. When it was over, wartime nationalist leader Chiang and communist Mao would resume their civil war for control of China. Both had formed an alliance with Russia against the Japanese. Chiang was a wartime hero, but Mao was a die-hard Marxist-Leninist who had close ties with Stalin. Wartime fighting against the Japanese had honed Mao's fighting force, and when the civil war with Chiang's nationalist forces resumed, the balance of power had shifted. To evade the Japanese, Chiang's forces had marched west, keeping the Japanese at bay, but this had allowed the guerrilla communist forces to fill a void, the only organized force resisting the Japanese. After eight years of exhaustive fighting, much of China was destitute. The communists offered renewal, hope, and sweeping land reform. Defeated in the Civil War, Chiang Kai-shek, 600,000 nationalist troops, and about two million nationalist sympathizer refugees retreated to the island of Taiwan. By 1949, Chiang had proclaimed Taipei, Taiwan, the temporary capital of the Republic, and continued to assert his government as the sole legitimate authority of all China, while Mao's government called for the unification of all China. On October the 1st, 1949, Chairman Mao Zedong officially proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China at Tiananmen Square. In line with Stalinist teachings, Mao set about transforming the country from an agrarian economy into a socialist state. Maoism really signaled a discontinuation in Chinese history, completely cut off from China's past. Yeah. So it's communism, yeah, not only you know, by name, but actually in real, ter you know, real terms. And Mao basically confiscated people's private land plots. And he believed that by doing so, he will create something better. Yeah, certainly never occurred. This, this is system never occurred in China in the past 2000 years. So he actually made it clear to his party and to his people, I'm going to make China second Soviet Union. So that's the only model we can explain China, China's sudden change of heart, basically, to abandon the everlasting, timeless private ownership of land by the peasantry. Mao's promise, the utopia, was that if you surrender your land, we have a commune, we will never worry about hunger, starvation, diseases. You know, we will become one big family. So this notion of one big family really, uh, in a way, is compa compatible with uh, Confucianism. Because Confucianism uh, really suggests at the end of our history, we'll create a great harmony with which people really, uh, sh people will share everything with each other. So there, there, there is a dream, you know, really, ultimate dream of Confucianism. So this is a selling point, happened to be the same selling point of Stalin, Lenin and Stalin, yeah. So there's an overlap there. Otherwise, Mao can never realize his program. He actually realized that it was useless trying to implement Marxism, Leninism in a country where there wasn't really an industrial proletariat. China's population in the 1930s was 400 million. Two million were probably city dwellers, so that orthodox Marxism would say China was a long way from being able to have a revolution. But Mao Zedong said we need to indigenize Marxism, Leninism, we need to make it Chinese, and that means having rural revolution, giving people the organizational basis to express 
their discontent at land ownership, inequality, and creating a liberation narrative, basically saying through very effective propaganda to the Chinese peasantry, we can deliver you from a history in which you have been oppressed, you've been beaten down, we can give you a modern country, and we're able to do it better than anyone else. And in the end, maybe as much by accident as design, that's in effect why Mao came to power, because he was able to demonstrate that this wasn't just a dream, it could become actual. Mao effectively saw himself as the man who would deliver the Chinese people to the promised land, whether people in China like it or not is really by the by. And if, you, if they didn't, they just need to be educated, in quotation marks, to learn to love it, embrace it, and in the end, enormous numbers of people in China did. The removal of the ownership and the sense of what you put in is what you will get out. Then after a while, I think it lasts for less than 10 years, people realize actually there's no point to work anymore because your next door neighbor did nothing but still they eat. So you may as well didn't, you know, do absolutely nothing and survive. So this is really the common problem uh, of this, you know, incentives. So once you create this, you know, very large, you know, production unit, and the people start to cheat. And this is a, really the downturn of most communism in rural China. You have officials misreporting to the center, we have plenty of food, don't you worry about it. Turned out to be completely false. Then three years, man-made hunger and starvation. The kind of figures is really mind-boggling. The great leap forward from 1959 to 62, which killed tens of millions. And the most reliable figure would put it at over about 40 million. And some would put it a bit higher, some would put it a bit lower. But if we use 40 million as a kind of general benchmark, you're talking about nearly the population of a country like Spain being wiped out. I mean, that is pretty staggering. That's nearly twice the population of Australia being wiped out in three years in peacetime. Heaped on the tip of a failed agricultural policy, Mao then asked peasants to prioritize industrial production over the production of food. Mao asked his people to stop farming and switch to producing iron steel in their backyard furnaces. How many people involved? 90 million. 90 million, imagine. So half the country start doing something really strange, yeah. God knows what they produce from their furnaces, but certainly they abandon their farming. Mao even experimented by eliminating people's names and identifying citizens by numbers only. The Great Leap Forward was introduced with a very good intention. It was going to catapult the Chinese economy forward, both in terms of the agricultural production and in terms of industrial production. Except that Mao didn't really understand science. So what he thought could be done simply went against everything that science would say. And he had a system, and the way how he managed the system was that there really was not much scope for challenge against his views. So the rest of the Communist Party went along with it to begin with. Communist rule was effectively consolidated and embedded into the public consciousness during a period known as the Cultural Revolution, lasting from 1966 to 1976 under Mao's leadership. Stalin certainly was one of the great monsters of history, but was Mao somebody compared to Stalin and would have to play second fiddle? 
perhaps Mao would have beaten Stalin in some respect too, even in the greatest moment of atrocity. I don't think Stalin killed more than 40 million of his own nationals over three years in peace time, something that Mao managed to achieve. Even Stalin didn't manage to put one out of every eight of his countrymen into some kind of political prosecution. Mao managed to do that during the Cultural Revolution. This period saw a purge of lingering elements of capitalist and traditional Chinese culture from society. Mao Zedong thought, or Maoism, became the dominant ideological thought of the country. During the Great Leap Forward, Mao's followers were expected to chant, long live the people's communes, and strive to complete and surpass the production responsibility of 12 million tons of steel. Mao is considered the greatest slogan writer who ever lived. Many were found in his famous Little Red Book. A revolution is not a dinner party. A revolution is an insurrection, an act of violence by which one class overthrows another. Power grows out of the barrel of a gun. In order to get rid of the gun, it is necessary to take up the gun. When human society advances to the point where classes and states are eliminated, there will be no more wars. There is no destruction without destruction. Destroy first and construction will follow. Making up for the failure of Mao's earlier attempt to transform the country from an agrarian economy into a socialist state, the Cultural Revolution removed bourgeois elements through increasingly violent and inhumane means. Mao thought that his comrades were basically sidelining him, to put it very politely, but effectively to usurp power from him. And he couldn't stand for that. And that's why he launched the great proletariat cultural revolution to educate a new generation of young revolutionaries so that the young people will know up and acquire revolutionary experience and protect them against the kind of revisionism that were being spread by people like Liu Xiaoqi and Dong Xiaoping. But really, it was first and foremost about taking down the Communist Party leadership that was not following Mao Zedong's wishes on a daily basis. And that's why the Cultural Revolution was such a brutal, widespread and chaotic event, because the actual target of attack was the Leninist Communist Party itself, the most powerful instrument for social and political control ever invented in human history. That was effectively incapacitated for a couple of years. It's certainly a major discontinuity of Chinese history. Certainly Mao promises a utopia, but he delivered a really a, a, a poor and, uh, put it this way, dystopia. It is believed that 1.5 million people were executed during the Cultural Revolution, with millions of others suffering imprisonment, torture, or public humiliation. Even speaking a foreign language was regarded as bourgeois revisionism. It was often the case that people would be displayed on stages, put in dunces caps. Sometimes they were beaten, sometimes to the point of being killed. This isn't completely about Mao Zedong's politics. In fact, he was inspired by kind of rural movements in the 1920s that he'd witnessed. He wrote about these, I think, when he was in his native uh, Hunan, uh, talking about how when peasants had arguments with landlords, they often used to just put these people in dunces caps. And so it has old historic roots. Public humiliation has been something that's been used in punitive systems everywhere but it took a particularly strong role in these mobilization campaigns under the communists. Monuments to Mao's China can be found everywhere. Noticeably in Tiananmen Square in Beijing, laid out originally in 1561, 
but enlarged greatly under Mao. The Tiananmen, or Gate of Heavenly Peace, is a gate in the wall of the imperial city. Built in 1415 during the Ming Dynasty, it was partly destroyed when the Manchus overthrew the Ming in the 17th century. Historically, the Great Ming Gate, then renamed the Great Qing Gate during the Qing Dynasty, and then the Gate of China during the Republican era, Mao's portrait still hangs above its entrance. It overlooks the monument to the people's heroes, a 10-story obelisk erected as a national monument to the martyrs of revolutionary struggle during the 19th and 20th centuries. Beyond is the mausoleum of Mao Zedong, constructed by 700,000 workers in a collective symbolic act of voluntary labor after Mao's death in 1976. To the western edge, there's the Great Hall of the People, used by the ruling Communist Party for its legislative and ceremonial activities. The anniversary of the Independence Proclamation is still observed here. Its arrival to the Red Square in Moscow, it was deliberately bigger, and the equivalent of the Kremlin is the Forbidden City. Where is Mao's portrait? It's hanging there, facing south, just like the emperor did. And actually, the greeting, when Mao stood there on the gate of Tiananmen to greet the huge gathering of Red Guards at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, what was their chant? Mao Zhuxi, Wan Wan Sui, Wan 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 Sui. And Wan Sui, which means 10,000 years, is the call for the immortality of the emperor. It's the greeting. We wish you uh, eternal life, as it were. But this was to Mao. So the square is where you can have these huge gatherings and annually, of course, every October, a huge parade of military might. Following Mao's death, many of his policies were dismantled and the revolution deemed a major setback to Chinese modernization. There are periods in which China does close itself off to the rest of the world, but I think perhaps that was a moment that has stayed with us as being the defining understanding that we have of China. The rise of communism has had such an enormous impact on how we view China that it becomes very difficult to look at China outside of that. In the post-Mao era, and with the coming to power of rulers such as Deng Xiaoping, reforms were introduced. Land could be leased back from the state for 30 years. China opened to the world and embraced an economic culture which has come to be known as state capitalism. How was it that the four small dragons in Asia Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea. How did they kind of develop so much and yet still maintain very autocratic systems? And they kind of decided, you know, what you do is you develop your economy and you do that by maintaining some levels of control over state enterprises in key sectors, like energy, telecoms, these commanding heights of the economy, but allowing marketization, entrepreneurialism elsewhere. I think what China's done is to create this bird in the cage model basically where you know you have the bird floating around but there is still a cage eventually and I think the state supplies that cage and allows the economy to kind of have a lot of latitude but it will never leave control of the key things it needs to control. China now has the largest number of tall buildings in the world surpassing that of the United States and Japan combined. China has more than 1,500 skyscrapers above 150 meters, of which 48 are super tall, above 300 meters. In recent years, China has been finishing more than 100 skyscrapers each year. More than 1,000 skyscrapers were constructed within the last 15 years. The tallest is Shanghai Tower, with 128 floors, and the world's second fastest elevators. In the 1990s, the economic reforms introduced by Deng Xiaoping resulted in an intense redevelopment of Shanghai, 
especially the Pudong. The city has since re-emerged as a hub for international trade and finance. It is the home of the Shanghai Stock Exchange, one of the largest stock exchanges in the world by market capitalization, and the Shanghai Free Trade Zone, the first free trade zone in China. It has the third highest number of billionaires of any city in the world. Shanghai has been described as the showpiece of booming China. Now, the country is embarked on the Belt and Road Initiative, a global infrastructure development strategy adopted to invest in nearly 70 countries and international organizations. The Belt and Road proposes overland routes for road and rail transportation through landlocked Central Asia along the famed historical trade routes. And a new maritime Silk Road referencing the ancient silk routes through Southeast Asia to South Asia, the Middle East and Africa. It envisages such grand projects as an overland rail network all the way from Kunming in Western China through Laos to Singapore. Belt and Road basically ride on China's path. Yeah, because China recognized there's a Silk Road overland and the sea routes crossed oceans. And they borrow this idea and try to make China an acceptable power to basically uh, negotiate with all other countries saying, let's build a globalization in which China is the center. It's the mixture of China's old practice and then the new China. This new China practice, I, I see the, the you know, genetic marking from Soviet Union. China often has its own agenda, which may not agree with the rest of the world. For example, China doesn't like freedom of speech. Yeah, but freedom of speech is a way of life in the West. Today, China is criticized for a policy of ethnic cleansing against the Muslim Uyghurs in Western China. You could actually maintain, and indeed the party would support you to maintain your ethnic minority. You just have to be very good patriotic Chinese, which means that you follow the norm in China. The norm, of course, is the norm of the Han people. You celebrate the same festivals. You don't uh, subscribe to any uh, foreign gods. You don't read uh, certain books which would tell you what some other misguided foreigners would think of as the gospel. You must just love the Communist Party and above all, Xi Jinping, and if you do all that, and you drink alcohol like Han Chinese do, you eat pork like Han Chinese do, you're all right. Tibet continues to fight to reclaim its lost empire. And in the former British colony of Hong Kong, captured in the Opium Wars nearly 200 years ago, China is taking control, threatening its independence. The Communist Party state in China is more powerful and effective in its capacity to control different parts of China than at any time in Chinese history. The most dramatic flashpoint in the early 21st century is over the island of Taiwan. The communist Chinese government wants to consume Taiwan into a greater China. But Taiwan continues to resist, arguing that it represents the values of pre-communist China. The Kuomintang in Taiwan considers itself to be the true inheritors of Chinese civilization and cultivators of Chinese civilization in Taiwan. Taiwan was, in any case, a continuity of Chinese civilization, but of a particular region of China. The same people with the same language who populate 
the southern part of the province on the other side of the Taiwan Straits, the Fujian. And they share that culture, which is a culture of a great many temple cults, as well as ancestral halls, but mainly it's famous for the temple cults. And Mazu is one of the most famous deities of those cults. The cultivation of Mazu is a way of rejoining Taiwanese with southern Fujian mainland culture and civilization. So in that way, Taiwan is part of southern Fujian's own version of Chinese civilization. All the essence of Chinese tradition are still very much alive. They didn't have, for example, cultural revolution to deny and destroy Chinese tradition and the traditional culture. So even people's language haven't changed to the mainland type. The writing system is still very traditional. The pronunciation of certain words and the vocabulary is very traditional. The manner is very traditional. Uh, thanks to the division between mainland China and Taiwan. The big problem with Xi Jinping's dream over Taiwan is that people in Taiwan are very, very proud of their democracy and their way of life. And you can bet on it that if that moment comes, they will stand up and defend themselves to the best of their capability until the very last moment. So it's not going to be a easy intimidation and then they will capitulate scenario. The Chinese government is determined to take it. And the Americans cannot afford to let that happen. And the real issue here is whether the Chinese government at the time can be persuaded that the cause involved is so high that is not worth them to doing. Uh, and the Chinese government can postpone it almost indefinitely. Although the statement by the People's Republic of China is that they will take back what was theirs, 23 million people on Taiwan don't think that's the case. They think that they're Taiwanese, and surveys have shown in recent years that Taiwanese identity has got stronger and stronger. So they feel very, very different. They feel like they're in all but name, they are an independent nation. Taiwan and the Chinese mainland still share many customs today, such as the events and rituals associated with the Spring Festival, Chinese New Year. The festival is traditionally a time to honor deities as well as ancestors, and an occasion for Chinese families to gather for the annual reunion dinner. It is also traditional for every family to thoroughly clean their house in order to sweep away any ill fortune and to make way for incoming good luck. Streets, houses, windows and doors are decorated with red paper cutouts and couplets. Popular themes include that of good fortune or happiness, wealth and longevity. Other traditions include lighting firecrackers and giving money in red paper envelopes. Confucianism is a common theme too, adopted nowadays by China's communist government. The government of China officially espouses state atheism, but in reality, most Chinese citizens, including communist party members, practice some kind of Chinese folk religion, especially Confucianism which exercises a sense of moral superiority, although unlike Europe, there was never a clergy. In the Mao era, all religions were regarded as superstitious. Now, there is increasing official recognition of Confucianism and Chinese folk religion as part of China's cultural inheritance. But citizenship still implies more an obligation to the state rather than freedom to enjoy liberal rights as in the West. Culturally, you know, this is a place where people believe in fate and they believe that they can influence fate by, you know, being kind or doing particular things. So today, even after 60, 70 years of communism, suddenly Confucianism is making a, a comeback. 
Some people have called communism a kind of version of, you know, Confucian sort of Leninism. You know, it's an enormous uh, kind of, still an enormous part of Chinese intellectual and I suppose cultural life, Confucianism. What is Confucianism in essence today? I suppose it is a desire for hierarchy, for stability, and communism in some, some strange sense accepts that. But if Confucianism represents continuity and connection with the past, so too today does the cult of leadership in China. This idea of leader of China is like a figure which is more than just a politician. They're almost like an intermediary between another world and this one. The emperor cult has been a constant and it's never really been eradicated. I mean, even the Maoist sort of insurrection ended up being probably one of the most intense personality cults that the world has ever known in the Cultural Revolution. I mean, he based himself on the first emperor in some ways. So I think this explanation of, you know, the, the, the divine origins of a kind of imperial, you know, kind of figure um, sort of makes sense because it's very distinctive to Chinese histories from the early times till today, the enormous significance and power of the leader and there being a singular leader and then almost leading people to another world where everything carries on. They're not just the leaders in this world, it carries on in the next one too. All dynasties eventually end. Some last rather longer than others. A few hundred years is not all that exceptional. This question is how many hundred years. Some of them never last a hundred years either. And if Xi Jinping can have his way, his, he will have to deliver his China dream of national rejuvenation. That by 2050, China will be rich, powerful, beautiful, and wonderful in practically every way. China will be second to none. Something that the rest of the world will come to acknowledge, accept, embrace and celebrate. What we have throughout the epochs is this continual movement or oscillation between Sinophobia but Sinophilia as well. So on the one hand there's this great admiration and fascination for this country that has, has this long esteemed culture that's unbroken across so many centuries, the creator and inventor of so many incredible innovations over the centuries and has been extremely powerful and extremely successful. So I think with that the flip side is that then there is this fear that this great power could take over. You can see that coming back through historical periods at certain points. A lot of the discourses we come out of Britain and America in particular, which has coincided now with the COVID-19 anti-Chinese discourse, is not unrelated to this fear of China's emergence as a global economic power. With the changes that were sweeping across China and with the emergence and expansion of the middle classes, that China would eventually be more like us. Like us meaning that it would, with the expansion of middle classes, want middle class things, including what middle classes want of self-governance and therefore progressive reforms towards democratization. Um, reality is that the Communist Party of China, whether it was under Mao or Deng Xiaoping or Xi Jinping, would never contemplate that. The Communist Party of China is not undemocratic. The Communist Party of China is anti-democratic in a fundamental way. It remains a Leninist party. And Xi Jinping himself believed himself to be a Marxist. So he is a Marxist-Leninist.